The Guardian. The Guardian Books Podcast with Sarah Crown. The Guardian has partnered with audible.co.uk to offer listeners a free audiobook when you sign up for a one month no commitment trial of the Audible service. Audible has over 50,000 audiobook titles available to download. Go to guardian.co.uk slash audible for further details. I think if I had to you know, choose one thing that characterised British literature, both prose and poetry, I would say it was geography and, and more widely I would say landscape. One definition of literature, certainly fiction, I think, is, you know, the idea of characters moving across a landscape of some kind. Novels teach you about a place. They teach you to feel and see it differently, and they make places larger. British literature, really, from the earliest, a lot of the Anglo-Saxon poetry is about the way environment and emotion are related. What a landscape and what place has sort of embedded within it are all of those shared uh, cultural associations and as a writer when you're looking to connect with a reader, the landscape is a fantastic shortcut. So we're standing in the Packard Gallery at the British Library watching the final touches being put to the Writing Britain exhibition which opens at the library today. I'm here with Jamie Andrews and Tanya Kirk who've both been involved in curating the exhibition and the space itself is absolutely amazing. We've got pictures of maps hanging from the ceiling and on the floor beautiful screens of British suburbia, which I presume has perhaps something to do with J.G. Ballard, and many, many exhibition cases filled with writing materials from the authors who have been collected together as examples of what writing Britain means. Jamie, what I really wanted to ask you is why? Why did you decide that British writing or British landscape writing merited an exhibition like this? Well, it's... It's a specific time, it's 2012, it's summer 2012, so there's something going on with the Olympics, there's the Cultural Olympiad, there's a sense that cultural institutions in London and the UK are um, taking the time to look at their collections and look about what their collections are saying about uh, the spaces and places of Britain which will be highlighted um, to the world during the Olympics. And so for us, um, it was a great way of combining the absolute strengths of the library's collections, which are its literary treasures, everything from Chaucer right through to J.G. Ballard, um, spanning you know, over a thousand years, every type of uh, manuscript, uh, rare edition, photographs, maps. So it's a way of trawling through that and um, really bringing out some highlights and at the same time uh, using those to talk about, about how we and how writers have seen Britain, both the kind of eternal spaces of Britain which remain recognisable uh, now as they were when they were first described maybe hundreds of years ago and also the way that the writers have, have marked the changing face of Britain and perhaps in a way created the sense of Britain and how we think about the spaces and places of the British Isles. So talking about material that's spanning a thousand years, he said, what's the earliest thing that you've got here and what's the most contemporary? Answering that backwards, the most contemporary is probably something we just picked up about half an hour ago. Uh, it's come directly from the house of uh, Hanif Qureshi. It's his uh, draft of the Buddha of Suburbia, which is going in the, the area looking at the suburbs, looking at spaces beyond the city, uh, and also one of his diaries where he describes uh, going to meet David Bowie, who, who did the soundtrack for the film. Hanif Qureshi is not the only novelist, the only contemporary writer that we're talking to. We've got material from people like Ian McEwan, Jonathan Coe, uh, J.G. Ballard, Graham Swift. So stuff that's never been seen before, that has been often still with the writers themselves, and they've had to go and brutal around to dig it out. Going backwards we've got um, the Exeter book which, which has also just arrived this afternoon from Exeter Cathedral, early Anglo-Saxon 10th century manuscript and we are displaying what's, what's that about? It's, it's, that? It's, it's, it's a poem called The Seafarer which is going in our waterland section looking at the seas, the coastal spaces of Britain and the rivers and the lakes um, and this is a, 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 the recollection of an old seafarer who uh, recalls the hardship at sea but also recalls uh, the kind of metaphorical power of the sea that shaped his life. We've also got early manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales which uh, opens just outside London in Southwark, just outside the city of London anyway in Southwark uh, and of course the pilgrims tell tall tales of the city and a number of the stories are set in or around London uh, and we've got a manuscript of uh, Piers Plowman uh, written by uh, William Langland, a contemporary of Chaucer, 
a very early manuscript again, which describes, well, Piers Plowman opens in the Malvern Hills, so it's the idea of the dreamer awaking in the hills, but there's a key part of the narrative which is set in London in Cheapside and describes the hurly-burly and the uh, slightly nefarious goings-on in London at that time. We're not just talking about the countryside, are we? When we think of landscapes, often, you know, the things that come to mind are things like Emily Bronte and the Yorkshire Moors, that kind of thing. But you're looking at city landscapes as well and suburban landscapes. Yeah, it's a really good point. When we chewed over the title, we literary landscapes was obviously something we were talking about, but we didn't want to use that as a title precisely, as you say, because landscape can all too often conjure up images of rural spaces or wild places, which, which are absolutely part of this exhibition, but which don't begin to tell the whole story about the way that writers have engaged with the spaces and places of Britain. And so for that reason, we came up with Writing Britain, which, which covers all of the spaces that we're including, which do range from those kind of eternal pastoral images of the British countryside through to the kind of slightly more unknowable wild spaces, whether it's the Lake District or the Highlands in Scotland, but also absolutely those kind of urban landscapes. Most of the British population live in cities and writers have uh, absolutely engaged with cities since the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Where was I born after I was born? Well, I was truly born in Whitechapel Library. You know, therefore, it's like a rebirth and, and it's like hard to talk about rebirth, you know. Um, it, it didn't change anything, it just gave me a great well of joy. And the reference library, where my thoughts were to rage, I ate book after book and page after page. I got poetry for breakfast and novels for tea and plays for my supper. No more poverty. Welcome, young poet. And here you are free to follow your star to where you should be. That door of the library was the door into me. And Locker and Shelley said, Come to the feast. Whitechapel Library, Oldgate East. And also there's more in-between spaces, Edgelands, there's a, a section of the exhibition called Beyond the City, which looks at what lies beyond the city walls, both literally and metaphorically, what gets occluded, what gets pushed to the edges. Traditionally we might think about the suburbs as being somewhere fairly banal and safe, tedious even, but actually we're saying that beneath the surface in some of these more anonymous suburban areas, there's something slightly dystopic, something slightly more interesting and going on. Now, I'm going to have to out myself at this point as a bit of a fantasy geek because I've seen posters for the exhibition around town and in fact a friend of mine, similarly geeky, sent me a picture on her iPhone of the slogan, one of them which is not all those who wander are lost and I happen to know that that's taken from Lord of the Rings which of course is a uh, fantasy. It's, it doesn't really have its groundings in, in a physical reality at all. So are we to take it then that you have included literature that has been sort of sparked off by landscape rather than just actually bedded down in it? Yeah, we're looking at the ways that writers have been inspired by their own landscapes that they know in terms of Tolkien, the changing landscapes of his childhood, the development of industrialisation around his, his home, fed into the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. We're not saying that he's describing his, his childhood places accurately or recording them objectively, but clearly there was something going on that inspired him. And that's the case with a number of the exhibits, which, which look at the way that fantastic wild landscapes, which may have grown beyond all recognition from the original places that inspired them, nonetheless have their roots in real spaces and places, the British Isles. So it's trying to see writing about place as very much an imaginative exercise. It's not the same as a kind of objective mapping well, on that note, I think we'd better go and take a look around and have a look at some of the items that you have here. So, Tanya Cook, we're now standing at the first case at the beginning of the exhibition. Can you talk us through what we're looking at? The first section is called Rural Dreams, and we've opened the section with a, a kind of a look at the way that legends have grown often out of the rural landscape. The very first item in the exhibition is a book called Polly Albion, which is a really long poetry book published in the 17th century by a man called Michael Drayton. And he actually made an attempt to kind of go around the whole of England and Wales describing 
the landscape, but also it's illustrated very beautifully with these engravings of uh, kind of gods and goddesses of the rivers and the hills and these kind of ancient figures coming out of the landscape. Is this a 1622 edition? Yeah, these are, we've got two different editions here so that we could have two uh, different pages on show. So one page sh- shows Yorkshire uh, and the other one is the very beautiful frontispiece which has got a kind of a Britannia figure on it. That is the very opening looking at how mm. stories come from the land yeah. and that's the starting point. And in the next case along I can see a book of which I am very fond, um, Susan Cooper's Greenwich. Is this then are, are the books that you have spun out of the legends of the land? this kind of literature we decided to have a kind of a section about the figure of the green man and how that is reused in literature so we've actually got a a green man sculpture from a from Alston Abbey in Leicestershire to show with these books Um, and then we've got things like Sir Gawain in the Green Knight obviously a a mysterious green figure Uh, Robin Hood can be associated with this and Greenwich which is a kind of a feminist version of the myth and the green man really is an ancient fertility symbol to do with the harvest and um, again stories that have come out of the landscape and that the landscape is very important to them. So let's move on a bit further round now Um, we've got a section which appears to be called earthly paradise could you tell me a little bit about this? Yeah this is about the idea of the countryside as being this kind of very idyllic place that people can go to to escape from the evils of the town and how often this is not really the truth. (laughs) So (laughs) we start from uh, the very first idea of um, talking about the countryside as this beautiful idyllic place which is um, by Alexander Barclay and it's called the Eclogues uh, and it was published in approximately 1518 I don't think we know the exact date it's not dated because Virgil did the same thing didn't he back yeah. in Roman times this is exactly it exactly came from that tradition ancient Greece and Rome mm. looking at the pastoral as being kind of beautiful shepherds cavorting and <laughs> <laughs> not really any of the work linen and yeah, yeah. <laughs> very clean so yeah the, this is the kind of the myth and how it was presented but then as we go through you look at how some writers have kind of satirised it and mm. sent it up so we've got people like um Posey Simmons, who wrote uh, Tamara Drew Drew. in The Guardian. (laughs) We're very familiar with that one. (laughs) We've got some part of her uh, proofs for that, which we've borrowed. So showing that the countryside, you you go to the countryside to get away from all of this turbulence, but it it brings it all with you. Yeah. Yeah. And we're now, as the exhibition isn't completely built yet, we're now going into the strong room where some of the final exhibits are being kept to go and look at some of Faye Godwin's photographs. Obviously, it's a text-based exhibition in that we're looking at looking at writers and the way they've they've uh, constructed landscapes. Um, but we've got an example here of uh, a visual text collaboration between the poet laureate Ted Hughes and the photographer Faye Godwin. And it was a real collaboration um, based around the Calder Valley, which is near where Hughes grew up, and is also the ancient uh, Celtic kingdom of Elmet. And so they collaborated on a book called Remains of Elmet, which explored this area for its post-industrial traces, the way that the industrialization of the valley, which had overtaken the original kind of wild landscape, was in turn being reconquered by nature. And we can see here some photos, uh, one of them called Lum Chimneys, which is of a chimney of a former mill now covered by bracken and plants, very much taking on on an aspect of a tree. Mm. It it looks from a distance as if it it was, absolutely. You see, Ted had said that he would like to write, but he needed the visual stimulus to write the poems. Ted contacted me again um, years later. Are you, have you finished yet? And I said, well, actually, I'm ready to start all over again because in the meantime, I'd done the Ridgeway, which, as far as I was concerned, cut my teeth on landscape work. So Ted went off with the early pictures and started writing poems. Poems came back to me, which triggered off new pictures for me. And in, in many cases, when we finally came to an end, we had some huge table and laid out all the pictures and poems, and quite a few of the choices of the pairings were his. I mean, some of the poems were quite difficult for me to understand, 
whereas none of my pictures were difficult for him to understand. So that he made um, very good pairings in many cases, you know, almost on an instinctive level. Another section is called Beyond the City, where we're looking at the construction, the literary construction of the suburbs. The word suburb first appears in one of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, in the oh, tale really? of the Canon's Yeoman. Oh, yeah, the Canon's Yeoman's Tale. And at that point, it describes a place on the edge of town uh, full of danger, full of thieves. We think, of course, though, of the suburbs as being uh, much more the 19th century construction of somewhere away from the hustle and bustle of the town. But what we're trying to show in this section is both that the suburbs are a dynamic force which, as the city expands themselves, of course, expand into the countryside, but also a construction of the mind. And we've got a good example here by John Berger, now based in, in the Alps, but mm. uh, a London, London post-war writer. And in one of his more recent stories, uh, in a book called Here is Where We Meet, he has a story called Islington. So this is probably relevant to Guardian readers. Um, the <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that bit out of you. The story Islington, looking at how Islington itself geographically has stayed in the same position, but in terms of how people think about mm. it, Islington is all of a sudden a lot closer than it used to be. And you can see in this story it says, for Londoners today, Islington is far closer than it used to be because as it's gone up market, as house prices have risen, as the uh, gentrification has taken place, all of a sudden a place that was originally seen as somewhat dangerous and far out has all of a sudden been accommodated by the centre mm. and been drawn much closer into the kind of hegemonic centre. So the suburbs, and really what John Burge is doing there is just reflecting something that Edward Thomas, the poet and walker and um, nature writer, was said a hundred years earlier in, in the early 20th century, Edward Thomas wrote about the suburbs being ultimately unknowable but essentially a construction of the mind. So, not a clearly defined geographic area, but something that really depends on, on this kind of subjective impression. And moving back a couple of hundred years, we've got a really nice illustration here called The March of Bricks and Mortar, where you can see literally, although the subtitle is London Going Out of Town or The March of Bricks and Mortar, it's a George Cruikshank illustration. Literally, Very the vivid. city, absolutely, it's literally the city. It's spades and bricks getting up and marching, going out to attack the countryside. So, of course, you've got the suburbs positioned uneasily between the rural and the urban, and as being something that are conquered by the, the onslaught of a city. Fascinating to see the concerns that we still have today being first aired, you know, hundreds of years ago. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that we, we definitely wanted to do with the exhibition, was to try and show how things that we talk about today in terms of space and place are absolutely nothing new. So, you know, fears of what lies beyond the city, as we said, date back to Chaucer. So there's, a, there's a good bit in the industrial sector looking at the fear of railways and you know at the moment it's a very current topic with yeah, uh, the yes. debate around high speed 2 and the impact that high speed 2 will have well that's nothing new George Eliot was writing about it in middle March William Wordsworth was writing poems to protest against the arrival of the railways in the Lake District so you know nothing new what are we looking at now? Uh, so we think, we think of Arthur Conan Doyle, author of Sherlock Holmes and so much more as being the chronicler of the city, Absolutely. Sherlock Holmes and Watson living in Baker Street, fighting crime in the centre in those kind of narrow uh, Victorian gaslit streets, which is, which is all true, but we've put Conan Doyle in the suburbs on the grounds that he was a suburban man himself. We can see here uh, an opening from the Strand magazine, which is where he did, in fact, publish a number of his Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and day with Dr Conan Doyle. <laughs> yeah, day with... So it's an at-home piece in the Strand, basically. <laughs> <laughs> with um, Conan Doyle and a crazy wheel contraption, his wife dutifully beside him. What um, is that? Is it a bike? Well, is it's it a, well, yeah, it's, it? it's exactly. Is it a bird? No, it's kind of a, it's kind of a halfway between a penny farthing and a, and a pram, really, isn't Push it? Um, yeah, exactly. But it's but it's Conan Doyle absolutely delighting in his suburban existence. He mm. lived in Norwood, which at that time was very much resolutely suburban, removed from the dangers, both the moral and the physical dangers of London. Um, and it was from Norwood, from these safe suburban, family orientated. Uh, environments that he was writing about the mysteries of Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. in the centre and of course he wasn't just the author of, of Sherlock Holmes although he's known for that primarily now he was the author of historical fiction and we can see here he was also the author of that short-lived uh, genre the suburban romance which as um, as readers migrated to the suburbs of course writers had to cater for this new readership mm -hmm. which was embraced by Conan Doyle enthusiastically and the book we're showing here is called Beyond the city, the idyll of the suburbs, and it is as idyllic and uneventful and secure as, as mm. Conan Doyle's own life in the suburbs was. It's interesting um, you talking about Conan Doyle living in the suburbs and, and writing that gnarly, gritty detective fiction that's very much embedded in the city, because I was thinking about that when we saw Susan Cooper earlier on as well. Um, I know that she wrote her over Sienda Stone books, which are 
absolutely inherently of the English landscape when she was living in Florida. So do you think there's something in this idea that often writers will write better of their landscape when they're away from it, when they can see it at a distance? It's, it's a really, really interesting question, um, and it comes down to this sense of authenticity. Do you have to know the area? Do you have to be immersed in it to write about it? I mean, a really good, there's two examples of that, one of which is Graham Swift's Waterland, and no one can quite believe Graham Swift when he says that he didn't really go to the Fens. He didn't. He doesn't come from East Anglia. He didn't go there to live for a year in order to write Waterland. He's a, he's a South London man, and you can see that in some of his other novels. And he read a bit, he researched in the British Museum and the British Library, but he absolutely wasn't implicated in that background, and he feels it's not important because it's a creative act, ultimately. But that can lead to a sense of betrayal, and there's a, another example in, in one of the items that we're showing, which is Richard Llewellyn, um, famous for as being the author of How Green Was My Valley. And when he died, there was a sense of real betrayal when it was realised that actually he doesn't come, he didn't himself live in South Wales in a mining community, he wasn't actually Welsh, he was born in Hendon, brilliantly. Um, <laughs> but that's not to say that his, his depiction of uh, South Wales mining life is any less authentic than than a number of miners mm. who themselves did write uh, uh, creative accounts of mining life in that area. So, no, I think absolutely you don't have to, to come from that area. And in many ways, having that distance allows you perhaps to take the measure of a place mm perhaps more effectively. You mentioned Waterland, um, Graham Smith's novel. Um, let's go and have a look at the watery yeah, bit of the think. exhibition. Paradoxes of this region is it can look rather inert but there's more to it than meets the eye, and there is this elemental struggle going on all the time here. Realism, fatalism, phlegm. To live in the fens is to receive strong doses of reality, the great flat monotony of reality, the wide, empty space of reality. Melancholia and self-murder are not unknown in the Fens. Heavy drinking, madness, sudden acts of violence are not uncommon. How do you surmount reality, children? How do you acquire in a flat country the tonic of elevated feelings? If you are an Atkinson, it's not so difficult. If you could look down from your Norfolk uplands and see in these level Fens some idea a drawing board for your plans, you can outwit reality. So we're now looking at the waterland section of the exhibition and water is obviously hugely important when you're talking about the landscape of Great Britain because we're surrounded by it and it runs through us and anyone who's gone outside recently will know that there's plenty of it in the air as well. What are the highlights of this section do you think? I found this section really fun to work on partly because I'm from the Bournemouth area so it was like a kind of a homecoming for me but... We've got some great books about the seaside like uh, Grey and Green's Brighton Rock We've got the part of Ulysses that's set in Sandy Mount Strand in Dublin, which is kind of the seaside area of Dublin. We've also got a section about rivers, and this kind of looks at the way that rivers are quite often used by authors as a kind of a life cycle a symbol, I guess, um, the way that they're teeming with life, but also often authors use them as a kind of a drowning mm. scene, so things like uh, Our Mutual Friends of lots of famous drownings in that and um, George Eliot's Mill on the Floss as well but then also the idea of rivers is kind of this place from which life comes forth and Dart by Alice Oswald is a really good example of that and she to prepare for it interviewed people who lived and worked around Dart for quite a number of months and prepared this work that was kind of giving the river a voice of its own as if the river was a living being Like a ship the shape of flight, or like the weight that keeps it upright, or like a skyline crossed by breath, or like the planking bent beneath, or like a glint, or like a gust, or like the lofting of a mast. Such am I who flits and flows, and seeks and serves and swiftly goes. The ship sets sail, the weight is thrown, the skyline shifts, the planks groan, the glint glides, the gust shivers, the mast sways, and so does water. It also feeds back, doesn't it, into what we were talking about earlier, the idea of the pagan religious 
aspect of the landscape in Britain and the idea of river gods is a very old one, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, actually, the wind in the willows is in this section and I picked, selected it to go in this section partly because obviously it's famous for being the great book of the yeah, river, but also, yeah, of course, messing about in boats, but also because it's got this kind of middle section which people often forget about, which is called the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, where the god Pan appears to mole and rat. Yeah, it's a total return to a kind of a pagan Britain. So, yeah, I feel like the, the exhibition's kind of circular because you get that legend in the land at the beginning and the wind in the willows right at the end. As a matter of fact, we both know, don't we, Alexandra? The mole had been working very hard. It's all to do with the river. And a certain mole, and rat, and Mr. Badger. Alexandra and Mr. Toad. You must imagine what you can't see, and that there are voices to hear if only you let them speak. That's right. You see, darlings, you must listen to the river. It's just the same as ever it was and as it always will be. Always changing and always the same. Don't forget to start your free 14-day trial of audible.co.uk and to download your free audiobook. Head to guardian.co.uk slash audible. For more great downloads, go to guardian.co.uk forward slash audio.